Uh, this is my information I put up here for you if you'd like to connect with me on Twitter, uh, my blog, LinkedIn, all the rest, my email. If you have any questions, I say to everybody who I talk to or I teach or stand up in front of, you know, you don't have to be a client to call me up if you have a question. That's what I'm here for, especially being part of this group. You know, if I can help you in any way, let me know. Second thing is that I know it's a little dark, but that is a smiling picture of me. The reason why I do that, my wife, look at a couple of my video tips that I do for CBT News and other ones, and she goes, you don't smile at all. And I said, what do you mean? I'm a happy guy. I smile. She goes, but you get serious. And I said, well, and I get talking and teaching. I, you know, I just get into it, and maybe I can get the smile. So that's why that's up there. So in case I'm not smiling, remember that picture. I'll accomplish that. So this, if you can see that, that is my youngest son. The reason why I put up there is he asked me the other day. He's eight years old. One of the happiest kids I know. He has some physical challenges, but he's the happiest kid I've ever met. And so he was sitting there in bed. He said to me, on, I, I told him I was going away again for a trip. He goes, where are you going? He goes, I said, to a conference. Well, what does that mean? I said, well, I'm going to go teach a class. He said, oh, okay. Well, now, if you're teaching second graders, which he is, he goes, you got to remember that they all have centers. That means there's different parts of the day. You've got to tell them where to go. Said, okay. Because if you're teaching fourth graders, the older kids, it's a little different. So what grade are you teaching? I said, well, they're somewhere in between. I said, no, I said, they're older, they're adults. And he got a look on his face and goes, oh, well, for grown-ups, you have to let them do what they want. <laughs> so I said, so they should pick what they want to talk about. And he said, yeah, let them talk about what they want to talk about. So I said, okay. I said, any other tips for me as a teacher? He said, well, you've got to have snacks. <laughs> okay, we'll okay, have snacks. I said, anything else I need to remember? He says, well, the one thing you have to remember is after lunch, give them recess. Let them go run around. I said, okay. And then he looked at me and he said, but make sure you have fun. So I said, I think with the way Troy and uh, Tracy have set this up, I think we can knock most of those off. We will have snacks. You will be able to have lunch, recess. I'm not so sure about, but ultimately we want to have some fun. So when Troy and Tracy asked me if I would do a bonus session, of course, I jumped at the chance, and I said I'd be honored. And, uh, but I always ask, I said, what do you want me to talk about? What do you want me to you know, stand up here and you know, chat about? And remember, this is interactive, so it isn't a one-way lecture. You've got a question, raise your hand, stop me, talk. Let's have a dialogue. So he said, well, what, what do you think is most important? You, you deal with a lot of clients from you know, my companies. We have a digital agency. We also have consulting, which we come in and help people understand what they're doing. You know, I was talking to Bob, right? I was talking to Bob, talking to Bob earlier out here. And, you know, dealers a lot of times will say, I have enough vendors. I need another vendor, like I need a hole in the head. But I don't know if these vendors are doing anything for me. So they asked for advice. So I said, well, here's what I think for 2015. A couple things. So there's really two or three main points that I'm talking about, writing about, and working with dealers about. Number one is education. Dealers need to be educated. They have absolutely, I'm still astounded how the lack of knowledge in the digital marketing space, where they are now being forced by some manufacturers to spend a high percentage of their budget, and they have no idea what's going on. Dealers will ask me, oh, do you think this person's doing a good job? And I'll say, well, what are you paying for? What are you, how much are you spending? What are you getting? And they'll say, I don't know. So I said, education. you got a jump on that because you're here. But even better, you have a jump on it because this type of environment, you're working with advisors. This isn't just you're going to a session, see you later, go home and try to figure it out. The great thing about this event is that you now have access to each other. You have access to the vendors to just throw out an email. I have a question, I have a thought, I have a report. Anybody hear this vendor? What do you think about this? Can anyone help? That's such an advantage, and I applaud you for being there. So that's education. Number two is vendors. You gotta start holding your vendors accountable. You, how many dealer principals do we have here, or dealer general managers, big time people, right? You guys gotta hold your vendors accountable. Digital marketing managers, sales managers, you guys are the ones also, you gotta hold your vendors. You got enough people coming in wanting your money. You gotta make sure they're working for you. If they're not going to be accountable, if they're not gonna explain to you every month, here's what I did for your X amount of dollars, and here's why I did it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. And if anyone here as the franchise dealers, they always go, well, I'm a big co-op. 
That amount of money you're saving from co-op is a complete waste if that vendor is screwing you over and you don't know it, it's costing you more in the long term. So again, if you don't know, find help, get education, find an advisor, find someone who can say, can someone make sense of this? If you need help, I'll always do it. Again, like I said, not charging you nothing, just if I'm here to help people. But lastly, the most important thing that I thought about is this concept of unified marketing, and that's what I want to talk about. Too often, Bob and I were talking about this, I was like, ah, you're a club, you're here, you know what I'm talking about. Too often, you have everything in silos, okay? Everybody has all of our little pieces. And this can be not just from marketing, but also within your dealership itself, okay? So, let me explain what I'm talking about. Your name, sir? Sorry? Mark. Mark. Mark's going to be my dealer principal, okay? You are going to handle, well, Troy. Troy will handle all my offline or traditional marketing, and you're going to handle my digital marketing, and you're going to handle my social media, and you're going to handle, oh, wait, sorry, lead handling over here, and we got somebody who's going to handle road to the sale, and we got my website provider over there. So we've got all my vendors working for me, okay? I'm going to help Mark market his business, except here's the truth you can't talk to each other. Pretty odd concept. You're not allowed to talk to each other, so what do you do? I'm going to prove my worth in social media. I'm going to prove my worth in SEO. And if you challenge me, I'm going to say, well, it's because your website provider stinks. Oh, it's that offline person. They suck. <laughs> and that's a problem. And dealers, out of either they don't know or they're so busy, again, you've got to remember, the constraints you have at the end of every month. I've got to sell cars. I can't have time to worry about a lot of this stuff. I'm hoping my vendors have my back. But the problem is, you're spending a lot of money. I work and I look at dealers' budgets, $10,000, $15,000, $20,000, $50,000, $100,000 a month. That's not cheap money that you're spending. And yet, my traditional advertiser and my website provider have never talked to each other. So if he's running a commercial, or he's running a print campaign, or he's sending out a mailer, it doesn't look anything like the website. Holy goodness. Like I said, we can balance and argue about how many dealerships people are, are visiting every single month. But at the end of the day, if you're not having this unified message, if you're not making it easy for people to follow that flow through and follow your message till they drop on your doorstep and then your staff follows that, you're blowing through business. And yet, what does all your staff say? Hey, please, Bob, can you spend some more money this month? Because I need more leads. And so what do you do? Pump more money into it. And all you're doing is filling up the glass. And it's spilling all over the place, but you keep spending money. So the more you can unify your marketing message, which we're going to talk about, the better off you'll be, but the key starts with you. Okay? So, what do I mean by that? I like this quote. I can't remember if I came up with it or someone else did. If you can't see where you want to go, then you'll never arrive. What do I mean by that? It was you guys who are in charge of dealerships, or they let you out. At the end of the day, you set the tone. Again, I'm going to go back to Bob, because he and I were just having this conversation, and what he was saying was so spot on. He should be up here talking about it. Because... What he was saying was that we have an experience that we're trying to deliver. So dealer principals, general managers, everybody, we have a way that we're doing business. Now, how many of you guys sold cars? How many sold cars? Okay. Remember the first time you sold a car? How happy you were? How excited you felt? You were like, damn, I sold a car. There you're beaming and you thought the world. How about this? How did you feel when that person you sold the car to brought somebody else in based on how you did? And they said, well, I brought my friend in here because of how you treated me. How did you feel? Now my reputation is getting out there. The experience I'm delivering is going out there. And for dealer principles, the first time you open the door to your store and you said, I now own this. I am going to run it. Here's how we're going to do business here. This is the experience, and I'll keep using that word. Here's the experience I want to deliver to my customers. That's what I want. Shut my eyes, I can picture it. The room's buzzing. I got my salespeople doing this. Everyone's happy. Oh my God, I can picture it. When I open my eyes, how do I get there? You guys have to set that tone through everything. You have to set that tone. Now, for you right now, one of your little homework pieces is think about what your message is. And if you think about how your dealership is running right now, 
through your marketing, through your execution, is it driving you towards that? Or is it sort of pulling you off of that? And business owners, do you think it's happening, but you don't really know? It's time for you to inspect and see and look at all your marketing messages. So that's what we're going to walk through. Now, we created this graphic a few years ago when the Zero Moment of Truth came out. We were talking about how this is sort of the marketing life cycle. But there was a big piece that we forgot about it, so we just changed it. Because here's the problem. One is racetrack. We like that. Cars. But more importantly, service wasn't in that other one. Services there. So if we think about it, let's see if I'm, uh, yeah, there it is. So if we start up here, there's our starting poll. This is the research they're all doing. Now we come down to opportunities for them to contact us. Hopefully we're going to get the appointment. Oh, they bought it elsewhere. Maybe we'll get the show. We get sold. Reviews. Are we getting reviews? Are we getting referrals? Did we walk them into service? Oh, they serviced elsewhere. Oh, they're servicing with us, but oh, we didn't really ask them. You know what I'm saying? That is the ecosystem you have to work in now. It isn't silos. There's no silos, not one silo on that picture right there. But yet, every single piece there, a lot of dealerships run as silos. And all I care about in service is to hit my number so my boss doesn't yell. And all I care as a salesperson, I can care less about five years from now. I'm worried about this month. And my marketing person, all I care about is, did I spend your money? And you're not going to yell at me. And again, nobody's really looking at the whole picture. So we want to talk about unified marketing. We'll come back and refer to this in a couple minutes. So again, there's your silo. So when I'm talking today about marketing, we're going to talk about what I call offline. That's what people would call traditional marketing in the past. I'm change, trying to change the vernacular a little bit because traditional sounds old which means that sometimes when people hear a digital person go, oh, that's traditional, they think, well, I don't think it's useful. Now, Bob says he doesn't do any quote-unquote traditional marketing. That works in some areas. But it has value. I like it if it's done effectively, if it's measured, and it works. Great. There's a market. People still read newspapers. People still have magazines. They watch TV. Great. Use it. Market it. The key is that's what I'll call offline. So when you refer to offline, that's what I'm talking about. Online makes sense. Pretty much social media, website, online, research, blog, etc. And then on site. That's a piece that a lot of dealers miss out on. On site. That last piece to connect all of your market. They're so focused on the message they're pushing out, they forget when they show up. Is there any marketing being done on the web on site? Okay? So as I said, one of the pieces you have to start doing is demand your vendors start working together. You have to. You have to tell them, listen, we want to get together with strategic calls. You've got to share information. I sometimes, you know, we're doing SEO and someone else is doing SEM. We need to make sure that we're talking together or they could be doing something that's working against me and all I'm doing is wasting your money. So we need to connect everybody. Same thing with offline. The more I know that you're doing offline, marketing offline, I can use that online. That helps me. It unifies the message. Because if I see your commercial, and I go to your website, and I don't see anything that looks like what I saw on TV, you're creating a disconnect. There's two types of disconnect. One is the disconnect of, am I in the right place? Oh, that was the right name. I'll screw it. I'll go look somewhere else. The second disconnect is, well, why don't I see it there? Are you hiding something? Maybe it was an offer you did in your commercial. I can't find that offer on your website. Let's say that your website has that offer. Fantastic. But if I come on site, does your receptionist know about that offer? Do I see anything on site about that offer? Now all of a sudden, the disconnect is, what's going on? That word transparency that's getting thrown around a lot, but it is needed, is the same thing that used to happen a few years ago when someone would be sitting on your site, you're giving them a sale price, whatever, and somebody's on their phone, and there's an internet price, but you forgot to tell them about the internet price, and they're going, well, what is this? Oh, well, that's for internet customers. Well, how the hell do you think I found you? I found you on the internet. <laughs> Disconnect, you're ripping me off, I'm out of here, you're reinforcing the stereotype of you're hiding something in your pocket. Bob said it again. I'm going to use him again because I like what he was saying before, is that fact that he said, years ago, customers needed you. You were the possessors of all the information for cars. So if I needed to figure out cars, I got to come to you. Now with the internet, so I got to come to your place to do business. Right? 
And guess who felt comfortable? You did. Now with the internet, I can sit on my couch and do all the research I want. Now when I come to you, I'm armed with things. See, you need me. See, it's reversed. You need me to show up or else you don't do business. But what happens is when I show up, okay, you better treat me like I'm knowledgeable. Okay? Who's comfortable now? Me, customer. Okay? But it all has to connect. Like you need to get your vendors helping you. You've got to get them working together. Or if you don't, then get an advisor to be your mediator. If you don't have time, invest in getting somebody who has your back, who's knowledgeable, who will sit at your table every single month and say, I got it. I'll go talk to your vendors. I'll get them doing it. That's what you hire me to do. Okay? The point is that everything you do has a ripple effect. This is from a marketing perspective. This is also from a process perspective. If you change one thing somewhere else, the days of silos are done. So if you change your marketing ad with Troy and say, send me out this, I need you to make a direct mail piece for me. Thank you very much. And it's a beautiful direct mail piece. That is a rock into the pond. If my website doesn't see it, if my staff doesn't see it, well then that ripple affects that staff. If you come to me and say, Glenn, our SEM is doing great. I want to increase my budget by $3,000. Fantastic. I'll get the phone, Mr. Brand. No problem. But you didn't staff properly. So that ripple hit the people who are answering the phones, and all of a sudden, all they're doing is cherry picking, and then you're just wasting time anyway. So again, all of these things you have to really look at when you make decisions. How does that flow through into that whole ecosystem of that whole racetrack? So, any questions before we go a little further into this? Make sense? Yeah? You look a little stunned. Or you're just tired, either one. But we'll get you going. So let's map the journey. Again, this is not anything that you may or may not know. My job is to sew all the pieces together like a quilt. So it's not like there's going to be a revolutionary thing that I say, hey, you should have a website. No. We're talking about how are we sewing this all together. So we want to map your journey. We want to figure out what is the message that we're pushing out to get them to my store? Then what's that message when they're there? And then when they leave, what's my message? And does it all unify? Does it all tie back to that experience that we decided way in the beginning, this is the way we want to treat our customers, this is the way we want to think about our customers, and there's all of this tied through. Offline, online, on-site, it's all tied to the end. Is it all unified? So, purchasing journey begins pretty easy. What are they going to do? See your marketing. The game is, am I staying on the list? Okay? Right now, who's, who's from this? Tracy, you're from this area, right? If I wanted to buy a Chevy, how many places could I buy within an hour of where I'm standing right now? Oh. Half an hour. 15. Okay, 15. 20. See, so the game is no longer the car. I'm not shopping for the car. Got to get that. That's the key. I'm no longer shopping for the vehicle because I can find the vehicle anywhere. I can get it. Anyone, you sell me a car, you ship it to me from New Mexico. Doesn't matter. So I can find the car. What I'm looking for now is I'm shopping for the dealership. Who's going to take care of me? I'm looking for the right marketing message that resonates with me. And as I'm doing my research, is it consistent? And I'm hoping that we get some time, maybe I'll talk with Tracy and Troy, this why buy from me, you'll hear a lot of people talk about it, I talk about it, why buy from me message, I will help you. There's an exercise we do with a lot of dealer groups that cut through the BS why buy from me. I'll teach you how to really hone in your why buy from me message, not just generic stuff. But anyway, so these guys are there, they're looking again, online recommendations, meaning reviews from your customer, their friends who's recommending you. Because remember, recommendations, reviews are gold because no one really believes your marketing message. It's nice, but you're a marketer. You're supposed to tell me you're great. You're supposed to tell me you do a good job. I need to hear from your customers that what you actually do is what you say you do. Now I'm going to take a quick little pit stop here to talk about your employees. Because if your employees are not in this game with you in terms of marketing, if they don't understand what you're trying to do, if they do not understand the marketing messages, or even know what the marketing messages are, 
There's a lot of times where I talk to salespeople and they don't know what ad is running. They don't know a commercial is running. The receptionist doesn't know what ad is running or what you're doing. And phone calls are coming in and that is a bad first impression. So again, you need to get them in. And how you're going to do that is the same thing. Documented processes, accountability. What I mean by documented process is not just road to the sale, but if I change a cable TV spot, who needs to know? How do I transmit that information throughout my dealership? How do I show them? How do I hold them accountable to know it? That's what I'm talking about. This is marketing accountability. This is unifying that message because, again, you could have the prettiest marketing messages out there and your staff has no idea or if your staff isn't bought into that experience of what they do every single day is going to help me deliver that great experience and all they care about is their sales numbers, stop marketing. Stop marketing because if you're telling them, oh, we treat people great and your customers are profiling people on the, on the lot, just rushing them through or grilling them or making them feel uncomfortable, I don't care what great, cozy, you know, Norman Rockwell painting poster you're putting out there, how great you are, your support team, your staff is not doing what they need to do. Okay? A lot of people don't think about marketing, so they talk, they invade this, how they contact you. I'm going to just touch base on this because. This is all marketing, and a lot of people don't think it's marketing, but it's marketing. Everything you do is marketing. How you dress is marketing. How your whole showroom looks is marketing. How the parking lot is marketing. Everything that happens, the way the bathrooms are marketing. If I walk by a bathroom and I see a mop bucket, and the thing because somebody left it there by mistake, that subconsciously gives me a little generic to who you are. That means you're not paying attention. So that immediately we take it on to ourselves and say, well, if you're not going to pay attention to that, how are you going to pay attention to me? Okay. So how do they first contact you? Well, one of the ways, of course, is the phone. So think about the marketing. When I say marketing in your script, what are they saying? Do you even have scripts? Have you looked at the scripts? We can't have a tendency. We have our team over here who are trainers for BBCs, right? Right? There we go. We spend a lot of money over there and say, make sure those people answer, but we don't pay any attention to the receptionist. God forbid, please don't let the salespeople answer the phone. Oh my God. Let alone, we focus to that front of the house. God forbid, the service advisors. Nobody pays attention to service, although they generate 60% of the revenue. God forbid we pay attention to that big money making machine in the back. Oh, here, we'll give you 5% of the marketing budget. Keep going. But you got to use way twice as many people in the back answering the phone. So again, what are they saying? How are they responding? Does it support the image that you want to do? If you're trying to be the most helpful, we want to put ourselves out there as the most educational. We're there providing knowledge. Well, is that what the people are doing? So again, there also has to be an accountability measure to this. But even just go back and read your scripts if you have them. Is there anything in there that is supporting your marketing message? From a BDC standpoint, it's a little easier for your sales because you can say, well, day one, I want you to do this. Day two, I want you to send, send out the why buy from me. Day three, why buy from me, salesperson. Here's some information. Here, oh, great choice on the car. It's a little bit of marketing, but everything you do, every time somebody answers, it isn't just a can. It's a great day to come to Glenn's Toyota. That's not what I'm talking about. Understand, teach them, get them continually focused on what they're doing and does it support our overall goal of who we want to be as a dealership. Email, every email that goes out. Again, we focus on just the couple salespeople or service people. What about the managers? What's in their email signature? Is there a link in their email signatures that say, see what our customers say, driving to a page, showing all the reviews? That's marketing. How they're responding. How do you actually go back and look in CRM? That's why I put CRM for playing. How, how often do you go back and look at the CRM and see what people are doing? Are they using the templates that you put? Or are they writing their own? And are they, if they're writing their own, is it grammatically correct? Are they providing information? Oh, God forbid, are they answering the questions that the person asks? Holy God, what a novelty. And the reason I'm joking like that is I go into dealerships and I'm like, how the hell is this going on? Because again, all they're thinking is marketing is outside. 
That's the big billboard. That's that website thing. What I do, I'm selling cars. That's not marketing. Absolutely everything you're doing is marketing. So I'm saying this is a little bit bigger than just my agencies have to talk. It has to weave through all of your staff. Okay? This one, I think, is the biggest one. At the dealership. When I walk in, is everything I see in here supporting that overall experience that we want? The minute I drive in, I know a lot of dealerships like to line up the car. Oh God, they're out there with a tape measure. And, oh, we got them all lined up. Fantastic, but there's cigarette butts as I walk in. Or the brochures are messy. Or the receptionist doesn't pay attention to me when I walk in. Or maybe all of it is. And it's perfect and it's beautiful. But it's pristine and empty except for the cars. Where's all the marketing? Online, you told me you were a great supporter of the community. I don't see any signs here that show me that you support the Little Leagues or you're doing something for a local charity or whatever. Or, hey, online, I saw that you were the dealer raider, uh, Toyota dealer of the year. But I come in, there's no banner. Like, sure as hell, I'm going to see the big $2.99 monthly sale thing that, oh, no, because the manufacturer sent that to me. So I'll hang that up here. But there's no personality. That's what I'm saying. You know, Tracy, I applaud because. Tracy's probably as good as anybody. What you see online, you see probably even more when you get on site. You almost can't believe it. You're going, oh, goodness, this is even crazier than I thought. Think about it. What are you telling people? What messages are you out there? That's, I should be able to walk into the dealership and feel, this is the right place. This is the place I read about. Oh, yeah, I remember somebody in the reviews were talking about the waiting room. Oh, there it is. They do. They have that kid section over there. I read about it. Whatever. I know manufacturers have some structure that there's only so much you can do here and there, but still, you can still find ways around it, writing through blogs about your area. Dealer did it, it was fantastic. He had a he had a waiting area, and one day somebody came up and complained because someone brought their dog in. The person got indignant, how can you let a dog in? Blah 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 blah. So the guy thought about it and said, fine, fine. What he did was he made two waiting areas, one for animals, one for people. And instead of having cookies, he had doggy treats and cat treats and everything else like that. Big thing, got in the newspaper, people wrote about it, people loved it. And saying, so now you write about that and walk on site. Why wouldn't you have that visible? So there's probably things that you do in your dealership that you have not thought about. And what I'm talking about uh, these. We love to hang the awards that you get, but people don't know what those awards are just because you're a diamond, whatever. People are like, what the hell is that? Tell them what it is. But bring all that stuff. Most of those great things that you have are tucked back maybe in the service area or on the hallway to the bathroom that nobody sees. Get it out front. Get it out front. You may think it's a distraction because I'm selling a car. No, you're not. You're selling yourself. That's what you're selling about. You're selling the experience of. Please do business with me. I'm going to take care of you. And long term, don't ever think of going anywhere else. So I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. So as we go through this customer life cycle, as I said, here we are. We've got them to call. We've got the appointments. We've got them to show up. They're standing in our dealership. They like what they see. So we're going to walk through a couple things moving on. Any questions? There is one tip I'm going to do before I forget it. I want you to go back from a customer service standpoint. Take what I call a 30 second challenge. I want you every day for the next week or three days, however you want to do it. Pick a different location in your dealership every day and stop for 30 seconds. And don't say anything, just stand there. Look around. Really look around. That's what your customer sees. Are you happy? Listen to what's going on. Listen to how the receptionist answers the phone. Listen to how the salespeople talk to customers. Listen to how your employees talk when they don't think customers are listening. Okay. Are you happy? And do that over and over and over again. That gives you a really good sense of all of this marketing, all of everything. As you drive up every day, you, you stop seeing it. It's like looking at your website. After a while, you stop seeing your website. I can ask any of you to go find a car on your website in two seconds. You can do it, but it still could be a crappy experience. If you just know how to get around it. You've seen it so much. You stop seeing things. Go give three or four cars 
to your family or friend and say, go find these cards on my website, and then ask them questions like, was it easy? Could you find them? Could you see why? Did you, were you compelled to call me? Did you like what you see? What could I do better? Did you get my why buy from me message? Then tell them to take the same three cards and go find them on your competitor's site. Do the same questions. What was better? What was it? See, this is, what, this is how the marketing does it. It isn't just pretty, it's functionality too. When they drive up, every morning when you drive up, just stop for a minute. When you do that couple you know, feet walk into your building, just stop and look around 30 seconds. Is everything good, clean, whatever? Again, that's marketing. You've done spent all this money to get them there. You better not blow it. And stop thinking about leads on your website. 70% 70 70 of people are just going to walk in. They're going to do all this research. They don't want to give you control of anything. They don't want to talk to you because they're afraid you're going to bombard them. Because my BBC team has done such a good job, they're going to have a phone calls, emails. Here you go, please come in, let me help you. They want control. So you better not blow it. That's what I'm saying. That's why on site marketing is so important to connect the dots that they know where they are. They're comforted. And we can debate 1.3, 1.4, 2.7, what dealers, ships that people visit. It's regardless. I, when they get on your dealership lot, either the first place or the second place they're going, so don't blow it. Part of blowing it is your marketing doesn't connect with them on site. All right, so to buy or not to buy, where's their marketing in here? Well, they bought from you today. Is there really a, a really solid process after I sign the papers with you to go bring them to service? Or is that salesperson just like, I'm done, good, give me my next up, next? Instead of thinking of the whole thing, are do your salespeople sell your service department? <clears throat> do they say, Troy, great, thank you. Let me bring you. Do you know that we have an award-winning service department? Do you know that we're the highest rated in the area? Our customers love us. You should read the reviews. Let me introduce you. Bring you over here. Now bring you to Tom. He's our service director. We're going we're to set up your first appointment. Do they do that? Or do they just go, thank God I just made my commission. On to the next. Let service fend for themselves. Again, where's that disconnect of marketing? I want to retain these people, bring them over to service. So again, what are you doing in that handle? How are you employees marketing your service department as a great place to service? Or are you just saying, well, I hope they do their job as I did mine, I sold my car. What happens if they don't? What type of marketing are you doing to follow up with them to get them back in outside of, hey, you missed your appointment, Hey, uh, I have 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock tomorrow. What's best for you? Hello, can you come in? Please come in. Please come in. They left for a reason. It's okay. Just because they came to you, they're still in the market. Market to them. Hey, I saw you left, but here, let me remind you how great we are. Hey, when we were talking about uh, that car, we, you also mentioned this other brand. Here's reviews of that. Hey, I know we were talking about the fact that you want a family. Here's an article about how safe our cars are. Or do you just focus on, please come in, please come in, please come in, please come in. So what marketing are you doing? See, you gotta change your thought process a little bit on that. So again, and then lastly, you know, one of the last ones is ongoing marketing. What are you doing? How are you marketing for your service? Do you have a service PDC? Or do you have someone calling up? Or are you just hoping that they're gonna come in? Coupons, email newsletters. You know, what are you doing to help drive that traffic? Even equity mining. Is equity mining a true process in your dealership? To market to someone that we're going to take you off the market ahead of time. We're doing you a favor. That's how, that's how nice we are. We're going to get you out of your lease early. We're going to put you in a new car for the same or even slightly lower price. Would that be comfortable for you? Come on in. Now I have a free other car. You have to be comfortable. But I'm marketing, how am I doing this? And again, all of this keeps these guys intact, around. And what marketing are you doing? Or are you not? Or is it disjointed? Is it just, I'm just going to send a newsletter out. I got INN and they're just sending out a newsletter every month. But it doesn't connect to the message. Oh, I got somebody who's generating coupons. Yep, they're sending out coupons, except nobody knows what the coupons are. Someone comes in with a coupon. Whose coupon is that? That's yours. Oh, are we still doing coupons? Yeah, we're doing coupons. Uh, all right, I, can, I guess we'll take it. <coughs> Holy God, what kind of marketing is that? That's marketing confusion and marketing doubt. You don't know. Okay, so again, that's that. Now, 
This one's a big one. Notice I call it reputation marketing, not reputation management. I hate that word. I don't like companies that talk about reputation management in that way because anytime you're going to outsource your reputation to someone else without your control, you're crazy. Now, there are great companies that will help you. They will go through the process. If you can't do it, it's like anything. If you can't do your own content writing, hire a content marketer. If you cannot get your people to send out surveys, hire a company. But you run it. You tell them what I want. You get that information. Anyone who tells you, don't you worry about it, Mark. I got your reputation. I'll ask your customers. You know what? I'll even answer your views. You don't even have to know anything about this to send me a check. Run from those people. Run from them. Okay? But again, I said reputation marketing because this is the goal right here. This solidifies your standing. This reinforces your marketing as real with your customers because your customers are telling people they did a great job. Video testimonial, they do a great job. So again, how do you market that? You can put it on social media. You can create a blog post, especially if you get a, 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 someone from a draw city. Wow, I can market that video. I can create, I can put a YouTube channel. I can push it out on social media that somebody from that town drove all the way over here. I can do all the SEO I want, put it on the website. Fantastic. But again, people go, well, I can't get my staff to ask for reviews. Let me ask you a question. Do you let people go for test drives without a license? As you all smile and go, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Okay. Would you sell a car to somebody without checking their credit, doing nothing? Don't fill out any paperwork. You look like a smart person. You look like you're trustworthy. Oh. Here's the keys and go. Wouldn't do it. But yet, you are spending thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars in marketing, and you're telling me that you can't get your people to ask for a review. It's just part of the process. You have to do it because it's a numbers game. Not everyone's going to do it. But if you can get 5% of the people that pay you money every single month to give you a review, by the end of the year, you'll have so many you won't know what to do with. And you will dominate all of your people because that's what people look for. Because we have, as we joked earlier, we have been Amazon. That's the way we shop. Go on to Amazon, first thing we do is we look at the reviews from the authorities that this is a good product, and then we scroll down to see what other people who bought this product said. Don't be afraid. Sometimes people will say, well, I'm afraid if I get a negative review. Fantastic. We love negative reviews. Why? Because I can control them. I can answer them. And there are studies, and I'm not a big stat guy, but this one I like, was that people will believe your reviews, all of your reviews, three times more if you have a negative review than if you had zero. Because think about yourself. If you went online and you saw a product, 50 reviews, 100%, what's the first thing you say? Right, bullshit. I'm, every one of us knows someone in our lives that is just miserable. And if you don't know them, it's you. It's all right. <laughs> but they're miserable. It doesn't matter. Here's a bag of money. How can I get two? Here's a new car. How come I don't get oil changes? Whoa. So you're telling me that you service. So Tom, how many cars do you sell every month? How many do you service? Okay, so 650, 100, 650 people pay him money every single month. You're telling me everybody's happy? And I'd rather deal with the people who are cranky, let alone the ones that you're scaring you are the people who are pissed off and didn't tell you, and they just laugh. Because they're geeky acting everybody else. I want them. Because again, I can address it online. But think about it in Tom's case, if he got 5% of the people, 5% of the people to write a review, be it video testimony, review, anywhere, whatever platform, he'd have 30 reviews. End of the year, we got 360 reviews. Two years, close to 1,000 reviews at 5%. You guys work with salespeople. They can't sell. They can sell a car, but they can't sell somebody to get a review. It's a little crazy. 1,000 reviews. What would you do with 500 reviews? Holy goodness. You want to talk about dominating your competition? Forget buying more banner ads and clicks. Holy goodness. Go in that search box. If, you're, if you don't, Really understand this part, I'll help you do it. But you know when you see your Google, Google My Business now, whatever it used to be, Google Place and Google, whatever they change the name to all the time. You know how many times? Go back into your analytics in there, you can open up the dashboard there, it 
it will show you how many times that shows up in search every single day. They may not click on it, but how many times it shows up in a month. I'll guarantee you 10, 15, 20,000 that will come up in search. We had a dealer who, back when Google took all the reviews away, the BMW dealer, he had 400 reviews, dominated, he had 25,000 impressions, and he had literally 3,000 clicks to his website because of the reviews. His closest competitor had like 20. And Google took out all the dealer rated reviews and everybody else, and he went down to three because he didn't have Google reviews. Within the next month, he lost 2,000 clicks to his website, Still had the impressions. Went down to under a thousand. So we lost two twenty five hundred. And even in New Jersey, if you want to say it's two bucks a click, five thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars. He had to pay five, seven, ten thousand dollars a month to get those free clicks back to his website when just reviews drove traffic like that. It's crazy. But yet this I still fight the dealers with. I still fight the dealers like this. It's crazy. Oh, I don't think we can do it. I don't see the point of it. People don't look at reviews. Yes, they do. Ask every single person. But three years ago, it's sort of the chicken and the egg. People didn't read reviews because they didn't know they could read reviews about dealerships. Now everybody's pushing out reviews. You better have reviews. Video testimonials are the best. Yes? Do you have a preferred source that shows up better for that, or it just doesn't matter? The best thing? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, Google your business again. Google and Yelp make it incredibly difficult to get reviews. We just know that much. But that's why you have to ask. You have to really be a detective. If you're asking everybody, you're going to run across people with Gmail accounts. Now you see a Gmail account, hunt them down. And ask them, are you an active, remember, active Google user? Getting a regular review. Same thing with Yelp. Are you an active Yelp? There you go. The rest of it depends on where you show up, what you use. So the best thing I always tell people to do is take your dealership name and type reviews after it. Dealer name, reviews. And see what comes up on page one and page two. Don't just do page one, go to page two, because what's on page two could be on page one next week. And see, it could be local directories, could be like, depends on your area, it could be Angie's List, it could be Yellow Pages, it could be this one, it could be, uh, again, Dealer Raider, it could be Edmonds, Go see which ones are free, optimize them, get a couple of reviews posted in there, get a video. Again, so when people find you in all these different areas, there's something positive to say. Again, you want to spread the wealth. And again, there's tons of strategies to do that. Again, we can talk about that on the side. But this is something that's very, very important. Again, what are you doing to market these? So if I get one, how am I writing about it? How am I putting it on my site? How am I using it in social media? That's really the key. So again, it's really 300. Yes, uh, Just to chime in there, uh, thrivingsales.com is where you want to be. Uh, because as a dealer, it's an unbiased uh, website. So when the dealers rate you there, they're anonymous. And they use a pay engine uh, at Rotorcom scale, which allows the dealer to get the proper rating. It's very poor to get a high rating on that source. But when dealers or customers want to search who's the real deal, that's where they're going to go. And that's what we've been putting a lot of our focus to be highly rated there because it's actually the real deal. So you might want to look at drivingsales.com. I saw it in 2003, but it is the real deal. Great. Yeah, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of platforms out there. There's a lot of places you want to get in the review game. Cars.com puts reviews. Everybody's putting reviews. They're useful. And then take it a step further in terms of marketing is go talk to your website platform and say, can I get some reviews on my vehicle detail pages? So again, somebody lands on my vehicle detail page or there's some reviews about me. Not about the car, about me. People like me. Again, wherever I can market those reviews throughout your website. So again, you'll see that a lot. Like if you look at cars.com, they've done a great job. They land on a car and then there's reviews. So think about where can I put those reviews? I've had some dealers even take their test of video testimonials and loop them on a loop in their dealership. So there's a TV in the background and all the people here is great place to buy, great place to buy, oh my God, great place to buy, subliminal. Like the Jedi mind trick slips right past you. Yes? Another thing I want to add too, you know, you just have to grab the sales is we talked about this one earlier, uh, unfair advantage is buying that domain of your dealership reviews.com or whatever, and hosting reviews on that. Sure. Yeah. 
We used to do it for dealers. We used to create what we call I love sites. I love dealer name. And then we would create a, a review portal. And people would have their video testimonials and reviews and great things they're doing in the community. It became another website that would come up in search when somebody searched your name and you know, one less space for my competitors sneak up underneath me or a third party provider. That's so, a good place to start, Glenn. Yeah. Uh, we use, uh, in our store, we use Presto reviews. And we get a, a we get a review from every customer. That's just part of our process. And then those cards go into another box because they fill out the card. And then because you can you can manage those yourself. Now we yeah. put them in word for word, good, bad, ugly, one star, five. Uh, but you they allow you to do that because you're in control. So it's FrankMyersAutoReviews.com. But we take that card which has the customer's information at the top and what they bought, and you can see they have a Gmail account. They said, do you have Facebook or Twitter? Yes or no, and then we can search for that customer based on their email address. For example, on Facebook, you can use their their graph graph search, which you know we, we do that as well, and we try to friend the the salesperson friend the customer, or I friend the customer. So that that's a good place to control it in that environment. But then you can branch out from there. Absolutely. Your email address go to uh, ask for the Google review. They have social media accounts. That's a good place to connect with them on the social media account. Yahoo, there are people that look at Yahoo reviews uh, that are active on Yahoo. They're over uh, 40, but they're there. Uh, but it, it's still a good place to be. Yeah, and in the process, again, make it fun. Most people, what are they going to do? So if you're selling a car, you're asking for a review, and you just turn around and say, hey, do you have a smartphone? Do you want me to take a picture? What do you do? You take a picture of them in front of their car, in front of your logo. What do you think they're going to go do with it as soon as they get home? Throw it on their Facebook page. Absolutely. Look at me in my new car. Hey, could you mention me? Would you mention the dealership? Hey, could you send? Would you mind if we posted that on our Facebook account? No, no problem. Could you send that? See what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about. Marketing. Your people have to think about at every opportunity. How can I market this opportunity? And ask them, or did, did I, you know, provide great service? But did it tie into that initial image? Way back, way way back earlier when we had set up this is the way we want to envision our dealership. So again, all 360, if we're doing this correctly, all those silos are broken. Staff gets more engaged because they feel part of it. They, you have some smart people working for you. If you tap into their brain and say, how do you think we can market better? What do you think we can do? How can we do it? They will tell you. You've got a lot of people who on the side are probably doing videos, they're social media nut cases, they're all out there doing it, whatever. But Get them involved in this. Those silos, as I said, will be broken down, but more importantly, ultimately, you'll get a better customer response. So, a couple homework for you guys. Define your end goal. When you go back, even if you know it, think about it. See if it's real. Like I said, maybe Troy and Tracy will let me grab the whiteboard tomorrow for 20 minutes and I'll show you what I'm talking about. But is it real? Is it tangible? Or does it just sound like everybody else's why buy for me? And then, second, go through all your marketing messages at every juncture. What are you putting out in traditional or offline media? Then, is it transferable to online? Do I see it on site? Do I hear it in the scripts? Do I see it in the dealership? Do I see it in the waiting room? Do I see it in the email templates? Do I see it on my social media? Do I see it when we're asking for reviews? All of that. And then again, sit down with your team and unify. And then, as I said, get your vendors involved. Get your vendors involved on helping you to fulfill that goal for your marketing. So again, I'll leave you with this quote. If you want to move forward, take a step. If you want to go back to a standstill, because everybody else is flying by you. So either you've got to pick up, keep up or not. So that, as I said, that's my information. I'm here for the next couple days. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much for your attention. Any questions about anything? Like I said, that's what we're here to do, answer questions. <coughs> I have just blown your minds, and now you have a lot more to do. So again, thank you all very much.